The following interview was conducted with Dr. Billy Hooper, DV DVM, for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Wednesday, uh, June um, the 18th, 2008, um, in Stewart Center B26. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the oral history librarian. Welcome. Tell us a little bit about where you were born in your early years and siblings and school. Well, I was born in 1931 in Pawnee City, Nebraska, uh, during the uh, Depression and Dust Bowl days. I had uh, one sister and uh, two brothers, and we lived in Nebraska until 1936, at which time all of my father's family, who had been farmers, were essentially burned out in the drought of those mid-30s. Uh, they moved to Oregon at that time, and I lived in Oregon until I was 15 years of age in the Willamette Valley, and then moved back to Nebraska, and uh, again, my folks started farming there, and was with them until I was 18 and joined the, the Marine Corps. Uh, what was high school like? You went to high school there. Tell us a little bit um, about the, the depression that we're My high was. school is, is a bit erratic uh, because of where we moved to in Nebraska. We were out in the country quite a ways. There was no uh, public or school transportation. Nebraska law only required an eighth grade, gra eighth grade graduation at that point. And so while I had finished my junior year in Oregon, I did not re-enter high school, and thus I was a high school dropout at the age of 16. During my uh, service career, uh, the Marine Corps identified me as a potential candidate for OCS because of IQ scores and other activities, uh, and in the process discovered that I was not a high school graduate, and so they canceled all of that recruitment effort and it was probably the first time that I realized how important an education was. So when I got out of the Marine Corps, and I was 22 years of age, I wanted to go to college, but I did not know that I could go uh, directly because I did not have a high school education. So I went to the principal of the local high school in Missouri at that time and talked to him, and he allowed me to take both the junior and the senior year simultaneously. So in one year, I completed two years of high school, and I graduated high school in 1954 <laughs> at a much older age, uh, and uh, then did a, farmed a little bit and did a little work in aircraft industry and then entered college. Okay, what about uh, uh, college then? Where'd you go and also your professional education? I uh, entered the University of Missouri uh, as a pre-veterinary student in the College of Agriculture, went through a two-year program there, was admitted to the College of Veterinary Medicine at the University of Missouri, graduated in four years. I had entered with the specific intent of becoming a large animal practitioner, but because of some influential faculty members and some interest in teaching uh, and research, I decided to pursue graduate education. The Purdue University Veterinary School had just opened and accepted a class in 1959, so it was in its second year. And I came and interviewed here uh, for a position in pathology because that was my interest, was accepted, and came to Purdue then at, um, in 1961, at the time I got my DVM degree, in the Department of Pathology, uh, Microbiology, Pathology, and Public Health at the Veterinary School. Uh, and pursued then the master's degree first, and then the Ph.D., and then board certification in pathology, which I received both the Ph.D. and board certification in 1965, and stayed on the faculty here then until 68, when I went back to the University of Missouri in another faculty position. Okay. And then you came back to... And yeah. uh, from Missouri, I then went to uh, Georgia, and was on faculty at Georgia for three years, and then uh, Dean Stockton at the College of Veterinary Medicine here recruited me to come back here as say, an associate dean for academic affairs at Purdue University. Okay, we want to talk a little bit about that, but let me backtrack just a little bit. Tell us what it was like in the Depression growing up for some of the researchers that uh, that time frame, as you recall it. Well, I was really too young to remember the very early years, uh, but so much discussion in the family. I know that it was 
very difficult uh, for people at that time. Um, I don't remember being feeling really poor as a child, though in retrospect I know that we were, but so was everyone else at that point, so it was not that different. I remember taking uh, bread and butter sandwiches to school and the few children whose parents either had a sto grocery store or, or more well would have an occasional apple or orange and how envious we were of those kinds of things. Right. Uh, Christmas time uh, oranges were something we really cherished as a Christmas present because they were so rare. So the d depression years, I think, for all Americans, particularly rural Americans, as we were, right. were, were difficult years. And then uh, with the start of World War II, uh, we were living only 50 miles from the Oregon coast. And at that time, I remember being, as a child, terrified that we were to be invaded right away. The Japanese did drop some incendiary bombs on the Oregon coast trying to start forest fires didn't create any real damage, but the d days after Pearl Harbor were the ones that I uh, remember very vividly as only a, a nine or ten year old, but how uh, fr afraid we all were of being invaded immediately at that point. But, well, did you have air raid alarms at all or anything like that? No, we were f we much too rural for that sort of thing. Okay. But uh, all of the men, as I recall, formed kind of militias. and so <laughs> Everybody, you know, had their rifles ready. <laughs> they were ready to sure. to do something, but like actually, in fact, nothing happened. Yeah. Uh, That's a good a additional thing. Okay, uh, you enjoyed teaching at the uh, institution before you came here. You did a lot of teaching and some research. Yes, I actually I developed my interest in teaching uh, really while in veterinary school. Um, we had kind of uh, self-study groups, and I found that I had a bit of a talent to analyze information and help classmates and had some real encouragement from faculty and offered me summer employment so I got to work in some research laboratories, um, actually got some funded research projects. So it was the, the veterinary faculty which really stimulated me to think about academia as a, a career. And then when I came to Purdue in 1961, uh, I was a, um, a graduate instructor, which was a faculty member. I qualified for retirement programs. Uh, we were considered faculty, not graduate students as such. So almost immediately had significant responsibilities for teaching at Purdue. Again, found that I liked students very, very much, and they liked me. And uh, so I just kind of evolved into really being more interested as a a, fa fa a teaching faculty member rather than a research, even though I did all the required research for the sure. PhD and the degree and wrote a lot sure. of papers. Uh, but it was teaching that really held my interest. And then as I went through my academic career, I found myself more and more oriented to teaching type activities, uh, committees that dealt with curriculum, committees that dealt with instructional methodology, committees like here at Purdue University that first selected the Amico Teaching Award winners here, uh, became involved in things like student affairs. I was uh, chairman of the Purdue Student Affairs Committee for a couple of years, uh, got involved with the police committee that worked with students. So it was uh, about everything in my life seemed to center around students and student learning and teaching rather than the research or the service mm -hmm. environment. And that continued at the University of Georgia when I was there, it continued at the University of Oklahoma when I was there, but most, most of my career was here at Purdue. Sure, okay. Let's talk a little bit about when you came, what's it, 73, isn't that correct, when you came back? Yes, came, it was 73. I came from the uh, University of Georgia back okay. here as Associate Dean for Academic yeah. Affairs. So tell us a little bit about the, that, your responsibility and the students and your committees and a couple other well, things. Well, it was a, a very interesting time for the College of Veterinary Medicine. Uh, the f uh, first dean had died, the second dean had retired, Dr. Erskine Morris, and Dr. Jack Stockton had become the new dean at that time. He too was very interested in education and academic affairs, 
And uh, as associate dean here, before he became dean, he had started a, a thorough and depth review of curriculum. So in 1971, the college started with a completely new curriculum for the veterinary students. Uh, the faculty and its committees had worked through the first three years of that. So when I came in 1973, the lead class was entering their junior year. A major problem was that the faculty hadn't yet thought through the fourth year. There was no fourth year of the curriculum, as it were, planned. So the very first charge given to me by Dean Stockton was to work with the curriculum committee and develop the fourth year of the new curriculum program. And that was a tremendous challenge because what they had done in the process was uh, concentrate the basic science programs, condense that a little bit, try to expand the time uh, for clinical veterinary medicine, uh, move more courses uh, out of the senior year into the junior year in clinical medicine in order to free time for work on the clinic floor. But at that time, all of the veterinary schools in the country were focused on a four-year rigid curriculum, uh, courses throughout the four years. Uh, they were all, I guess, toying with, working hard, worried, confused about how to deal with this new era of increased clinical instruction. I was very fortunate in that at the University of Missouri as the chairman of the curriculum committee there, uh, I had the model of, of the human medical school, which had developed what they called a block system. And instead of teaching junior and uh, senior students there on a semester basis, they collapsed everything into one month units. Uh, and uh, students took fewer courses, but they were much more condensed. And that allowed them in the clinical instruction to uh, place their medical students into the medicine and surgery all day long, every day, in intense uh, kinds of experiences. Uh, we were so impressed with what they had done at the University of Missouri that as chairman of the curriculum committee and our faculty there, we had uh, started a block system for the veterinary students, and then I went from there to the University of Georgia. We were in the thoroughs of a curriculum revision, and as I was chair of the curriculum committee there, and we introduced a block system there. So I had experience at two universities and uh, was able, with some very strong support from some lead faculty members in the clinical area, to get the, the buy-in for that here. It was resisted by the basic science faculty, who tended to think that uh, they had more to teach than the clinicians did, uh, but the clinicians were ultimately won over. In the process, we introduced something else here in that curriculum, which was very new at that time, which was an externship program. And we were able to, by taking summer vacations and treating the senior year as an entire 12-month period rather than two semesters in a summer, we were able to free up uh, some time for vacation, a block of vacation, but then six weeks for an externship where we actually put students out in private practice with practitioners. That again was resisted very much by the basic science faculty and even some of the clinical faculty, but uh, they were ultimately convinced that at least it wasn't so much of the curriculum that it would totally ruin the students and they were willing to give it a try. It was just immensely successful from the very beginning. It improved our public relations, our professional relationships with the profession. Students absolutely loved it. Uh, student faculty were coming in and saying students really benefited from this because of seeing the day-to-day -day workings in a private practice and they continue that program today and it has now extended to essentially every veterinary college in the United States is, uh, uses that kind of program. Good. Let me ask you, jumping back a little bit, why did Dean Stockton think it was, the curriculum needed to be changed when uh, he came? Was there, there must have been some thoughts beforehand yes. on that. <laughs> Yes, when um, evolution of veterinary curriculum is very interesting. Over a hundred year period of the 18, uh, 1900s, 
we essentially added one week of veterinary instruction for every year during that time. We went from a two-year program of as little as six months in each of those years to a period of time in which we were having the pre-veterinary program was almost now four years. Vet school was a full four years. We had gone uh, even from the end. We had added pre-veterinary in the 1930s and early 1940s. That had brought, brought that up to two years. The faculty had gone from a curriculum, even here starting at Purdue, of like 14 or 15 hours a semester to 20 to 22 hours per semester. Uh, using any rule of thumb in higher education, we were killing the students with informational overload, uh, and they were uh, resisting that. At the same time, veterinary medicine in the 1960s and early 70s was moving from a very, very strong focus on strictly large animal, food animal type of activity to a much more balanced uh, all species, particularly small animal medicine. Uh, and at Purdue that was really uh, very prominent because in the formation of the veterinary school here, the primary public support was from Farm Bureau and their pressure on the um, legislature. So in the design of our building, we had really minimized any small animal medicine or small animal surgery, had only three faculty members in that whole department to begin with, uh, and, and minimal kinds of space. But through the um, late 50s, 60s, and really developing in the 70s was this real growth in companion animal or small animal practice an evolving interest in the environment, in laboratory animal medicine was developing as a specialty, uh, and a number of board certifications in clinical disciplines were being developed that both faculty and practitioners were wanting to develop a specialization beyond the DVM. And what Dean Stockton perceived, with a lot of support from academia in general, was uh, we had hit a uh, an end point of what we could add to the curriculum. It could no longer be all things to all people with a total focus on small animal. So we had to strive to find a, a better balance between basic sciences, preclinical, and clinical sciences, the application there, and if w within the clinical sciences, some opportunity for concentration, not not specialization as we would define it, but for concentration. So uh, th during the 1960s, at the time Dean Stockton came as Associate uh, Dean for Academic Affairs, we were having a number of national meetings of the veterinary colleges. And almost uniformly, the better thinkers and leaders in academic veterinary medicine were saying, we have to have a new way of approaching curriculum. No one seemed to have a very good handle on that. We had a few models in human medicine, but not very many. Uh, but we were willing at least to try. And uh, in my absence, because I was at the University of Missouri and Georgia during that time, uh, he had led the faculty and the curriculum committee uh, through this uh, total redesign of the veterinary curriculum. Uh, and then we finished that, of course, after I came, and it stayed in place until the late 1980s when another wave of curriculum change took place. And I, by that time, I was uh, no longer here, I was at, but at Oklahoma, uh, and veterinary schools then went through kind of almost a third wave of curriculum change. The, right after World War II, then the, the late 60s, early 70s, and the late 80s and early 90s. Uh, well, that's interesting. Uh, what, how did the enrollment uh, affected by that did, while the time that you were the, here? The, the enrollment was impacted very significantly at the time I was here because of um, national studies and, leg and federal legislative perceptions of health manpower. Uh, starting in 1961, there, were a, a, an, a, there was an extensive study uh, chaired by uh, Hubert Humphrey in the United States Senate, uh, looking at all of the health professions and the need. Uh, and Dean Erskine Morris from here was one of the people who testified at that. Um, 
out of that 1961 U.S. Senate study, there was a perception that we needed to increase the number of schools of veterinary medicine and we needed to increase the enrollment at schools of veterinary medicine. But as with most political processes, it took another eight years before there was any financial support for that. But in 1969, the federal government instituted what they called at that time uh, an institutional grant. And they funded innovative programs in instruction, uh, the early phases of computerized instruction, the early phases of auto tutorial instruction. They allowed faculties the, the money to hire, for instance, the clinical psychologists to work on the faculty, work with the faculty and with the students in terms of l learning concepts and teaching concepts. And this veterinary school took advantage of that. So in 69, they were, and 69, 70, 80, they were the recipients of federal funding, which allowed us to do a number of these things in curriculum innovation and hire additional people to, to do so. Uh, then uh, almost immediately uh, with that, within three years of the 69 funding, there was a additional growing perception of what we would call a manpower shortage or a person shortage in all of the health professions again. So the federal government, in addition to just giving money for like auto tutorial, computerized uh, assistance to the faculty, actually funded a number of new schools of veterinary medicine and significantly expanded enrollments. So at the time I came in 1973, we had just received the authorization for uh, the, uh, if we wanted the money expanding the enrollment by 35 percent and it forced us also to focus on a significant number of out-of-state or non-resident students because at that time there were only 18 U.S. colleges of veterinary medicine. One of the major concerns were all those students in states without them so their legislators were able to introduce into the legislation the concept of if a veterinary or medical or dental school uh, wants this federal money they have to address this underserved uh, need for student uh, positions in other states. So we immediately then entered into a um, expansion of our out-of-state enrollment, changed our admission standards and requirements, our recruiting patterns at that time. Uh, it also was that time in which uh, our national focus was beginning to, sh to shift to equity or fairness be it gender or racial. So in the early 1970s, we were beginning to give significant attention to minorities, to uh, diversity, and to women. Uh, up until that time, the veterinary school had had very, very few women. Uh, when I came in 1973, only five uh, students in any given class had been women at that time. Uh, we had almost no racial minorities whatsoever. Uh, and also because of the increasing demand for positions, we were uh, had the luxury of moving beyond the two-year pre-veterinary requirement to three years and four years. Many of the students had master's degrees. Some already had PhDs. So during that uh, 1970s period, we were expanding enrollment. We were uh, taking more out-of-state students, uh, giving us a very diverse student population. We were taking older students with more academic experiences. We were significantly recruiting and, and taking more women, and we were actively recruiting and getting some more minority students. So the population of the student body was changing very rapidly. Also, that was being superimposed on the student revolt and rebellion of 69, 70, and the hippie movement. So uh, the veterinary student body had lost that lockstep curriculum, that high sense of uh, personal um, dress style. Uh, they dropped the white shirts and ties for men. Uh, they dropped the dress standards for women, so almost anything went. Uh, we were not different than the rest of the nation, but it changed the, the perception of the student body 
from one that was very professional and professionally mannered and professionally dressed, the, the faculty perceived them to be a bunch of hippies. And so one of the problems we had to deal with was that perception of faculty who didn't want long-haired boys in class, didn't want kids wearing sandals to school, uh, really wanted to go back very much to that um, white shirt and, and tie day. So that change in student behavior, mannerisms, attitudes was superimposed on all these other changes of race and age and sex uh, at that time. So it, the 1970s were for us a very, very interesting decade in academic veterinary yeah, medicine. Sounds like a very much good, good kind. You were mentioning about one thing when you were here, that veterinary auto tutorial, that was unique at that time. Yes, in nice fact, the, the veterinary auto tutorial uh, actually had its primary beginning here at Purdue. A uh, faculty member named John Welser, who ultimately became dean of the veterinary college at Michigan State, uh, was very interested in it. And at that time, Dr. Sam Postlewaite in the biology department was also interested in it and beginning to form a little kind of a self-identified nucleus of faculty who were interested in auto tutorial. Uh, it also was the beginning of the potential for computerized instruction, though that was very early. So the 70s was also characterized by an effort to move away from the totally didactic lecture classroom presentation to more of a student-directed self-learning of explore what the issues are, raise the questions that need to be answered, and then find the information and bring that back. And while we no longer use those same auto tutorial, they were basically slide tape presentation, or even those simple computer programs, that concept has continued to evolve until now, for instance, in this College of Veterinary Medicine in the first two years. They have a course every semester that is this self-directed, independent student learning, supervised by faculty, but really directed by students uh, based upon cases. So it has again moved clinical medicine more into the first few years, but primarily it has given students a sense of why they are studying anatomy, histology, pathology, microbiology, because they see the application of that. So it's a strong motivator as well as teaching them to problem solve and become better communicators one student to another. And it has significantly changed the relationship of students to faculty because they work in very small groups of five to seven students. And a faculty member involved in that kind of a of program learns more about students in two weeks than they used to learn about them in a full semester when they just stood at the front of the classroom and lectured. Yeah, I see that. Another thing that was uh, sort of new at that time, that medical illustration started during when you came. Yes, we were very fortunate at Purdue University in that uh, some place probably in Dean Hutchings' mind was the concept that faculty, in order to be productive, and this was be based more on research than it was teaching initially, needed to have support help in present in scientific presentations. So from the very beginning, they designed at Purdue a what they called a medical illustration department, and were able to recruit a very effective person, Dr. Algernon Allen, we called him Al, uh, who was both an artist, a photographer, and a very creative kind of individual. And uh, while he initially did a lot of work with faculty on research, and that still they are a big asset to the faculty, as soon as they began to develop curriculum, then he began to work with faculty in developing their presentations in slides, in uh, uh, drawings. He was a fantastic uh, artist and, and could illustrate things that you couldn't even see in a photograph. Um, so teachers had that access, and that part of the veterinary school also expanded, as did the rest of the faculty, uh, and became a very important and remains a very important uh, component of the, the veterinary college. And with the development of computerized instruction, that flowed also into the uh, medical illustration area. They continued to manage that and manage the computer programs uh, for the college. Let's talk a little about the library. That was unique in, when the school was started, too. 
Yes, um, uh, we were extremely proud of our library then and, and continue to be. Uh, the college has set aside space for some 10,000 books in the library, uh, and faculty thought that was far too much. Most veterinary colleges, as our vet science department here, had a very small library, totally dependent on the central library for everything. But because we were just a far enough away on the campus in the south location, the veterinary faculty thought that if they had the library and the veterinary college students would use it more, faculty would find it more useful. So from the very first day of building design, they set aside space for a veterinary medical library. It was extremely fortunate in that the American Veterinary Medical Association almost immediately in their uh, accreditation program set up a requirement for a independent veterinary library, or at least one very accessible to students and staff. So Purdue became almost a model for that. We were extremely fortunate to hire Ann Kirker, who was a longtime medical or librarian, and she developed the collection, worked with the faculty and the student body, just a fantastic person in developing that entire resource. And because it was so useful and so valued, when the new buildings were built then in the early 1990s, the library was one of the major areas that received significant expansion in space and collection and, and personnel. All right. What about facilities? Were you involved? Were there a change, uh, expansion of facilities when you came in the 70s? Any additional building at all or during the time you were here? It, in, in the 1970s, there was almost no new buildings as such. There was, however, a lot of interest in and efforts in new buildings. Um, Dean Stockton worked carefully, uh, closely with John uh, Hicks, who was our legislative uh, assistant or liaison with the with the legislature. Um, we had some veterinarians who were prominent on in the Senate in the Indiana legislature, and we had a University uh, Buildings Committee. Uh, so much of the construction that took place here at Purdue in the 1990s, the new uh, f clinical facilities, the new library, were really the brainchild of Dean Stockton and a small nucleus of faculty members who at that time tried to look ahead 25 to 30 years and ask what the needs were. Uh, we also had in the process, though, uh, taken on the veterinary technology program, the two-year associate degree program, and taken on the uh, branch of the medical school mm -hmm. uh, in Indiana, converted our basement facilities for that. Um, so we had a lot of new programs, a lot of new faculty, uh, and we were just running out of room at every corner. Uh, by the time Dean Stockton left in 1985, uh, he had been able to raise that package to uh, the third level of priority in the university. So when Dean Hugh Lewis came then in 1986, he essentially had all of the groundwork done for him, all the basic planning in line, all the political connections uh, already sewed up, and he was able then from 86 to move that fairly quickly uh, into, and ultimately the legislature appropriated uh, something like $30 million for that new addition at that time. Right. So I c would have to say we did not build very much except renovate the basement for the medical program, but we did a lot of planning. But planning is important. Uh, how about the NLM grant in 1976 for the, uh, that was a uh, yes, unique in that. I, I would hope you would be able to interview Dr. Kenneth Meyer uh, in, yes. in, in your interview sessions because he was the principal person who worked with the librarians uh, in, in developing that and was at least a uh, co-author on the grant which uh, solicited the money for that. Um, my recollection was that that was a very effective program. It allowed veterinarians in the state immediate access to all kinds of library information, copies of articles, journals, books that they would not otherwise have had access to. In addition, there was a um, personal faculty contact component in which they could contact specific faculty members with questions. All of that flowed through the continuing education office and, and that grant process. 
And uh, they hired a young lady, that I can't even think of her name now, who was extremely effective as an assistant in that. And ultimately, she went to veterinary school and became a veterinarian because that developed her interest in it at that point. So uh, that was an important component in the veterinary outreach to the state, uh, which was another part of Dean Stockton's concern. Uh, Dr. Erskine Morris, the dean who had been present through the 60s, had not had an interest in developing professional relationships in the state to any significant degree. Dean Stockton felt that the, the relationship between the profession, practicing profession and the college should be very, very close. And he instituted a number of programs such as uh, taking department heads and selected faculty members to every regional meeting of a veterinary group in Indiana at least once a year and usually more often. He was very uh, effective in getting more faculty to join the Indiana Veterinary Association. He got faculty to be more involved in the continuing education programs of the state. Um, and as such, uh, the climate of the profession, professional relationship with the school uh, really changed very significantly in the 70s and they became very, very supportive. And I'm sure a part of that was responsible for ultimately leading to the legislative support for the new facility. Yeah, right. Well, I was going to ask you the annual conference. That's part of your outreach and continuing education that's been going on for a number of years. Yes. Uh, annual conference goes back to the Veterinary Science Department in 1890. Uh, you know, we had just formed the Agriculture Experiment Station in 1887. Uh, and right after that, there was the emphasis on the extension program, which didn't really become effective, I think, until 1889 or, uh, I'm sorry, eight, 1889 or 90. Um, but almost from day one, then, our College of Agriculture and its Agriculture Experiment Station wanted the Veterinary Science Department to pr promote programs, uh, field days, uh, fall conferences with veterinarians. And we have a good written history of fall conferences going back to that time. Uh, it was the, at that point about the only continuing education available to veterinarians and was almost always scheduled in the fall just before uh, farmers would be putting cattle into feedlots and you'd get the respiratory diseases of the fall. So summer was over, the main crop, main work was done. Uh, veterinarians had a little slack time, so that's why the fall was selected, and it continues today to be a fall conference. Yes, um, right. And uh, Dr. Meyer was responsible for that the years that I was here, uh, attracted large numbers of people, and I think was a very effective outreach uh, of our whole veterinary right, curriculum yes, program. Yes, exactly. And then you mentioned about the uh, Indiana Statewide Medical, that was on the facilities, that's the it, part of the program of the medical schools. Yes, oh, that, that was another uh, new experience for our veterinary faculty. Uh, the medical school concept apparently had been well received by the medical accreditation facilities. Uh, and Indiana was, I guess, the prime national example of a medical program which used outreach to other campuses for at least the preclinical part of the program. So when they approached Purdue University, uh, Dean Stockton was very, very supportive of that concept uh, and worked closely with uh, Dean Beering, who at that time was dean at the medical school rather than president of the university uh, and faculty committees. We already had some research work going that we cooperated in uh, and we had some continuing education interface. Our pathologists went monthly to the medical school and participated with their pathologists in continuing education programs. So uh, small inroads had been made and we were basically ready for it. And then the veterinary school building had been designed with an unfinished basement. The ceiling was only about eight feet and the floor was gravel and it was used strictly for storage. But it, the design was such that it was intended that someday it could be expanded. So because of the potential for the medical school program, the funding was made available to dig that basement out of two or three additional feet, completely renovated, and it became the home then of the uh, regional 
our regional uh, medical program, uh, housed the uh, uh, necropsy facilities, uh, coroner's office for Tippecanoe County. Mm -hmm. um, and originally, a number of courses were cross-taught with veterinary students and medical students. Uh, and we had both successes and failures in that. But over the period of several years, the medical students felt that they didn't need to learn the veterinary aspects of basic science, and the veterinary students felt they didn't really need that much focus on the medical aspe human medical aspects of it. And so the courses became separated and were taught independently. But it did another thing for us, and that was develop a strong networking with local physicians in the Tippecanoe uh, County area and with both of our hospitals here. Uh, those uh, many of the f the medical f people in those units became adjunct or faculty members came to the college to teach uh, we developed seminars and uh, outreach kinds of programs so the b veterinary school benefited tremendously from the medical school program because of the cross f fertilization that was possible the friendships that develop between medical f people and the veterinary people, uh, our research and programs improve because of that as well as our, our teaching programs. That's so. a collaboration. Uh, yeah. Because of the cooperation. Sure, that's so, right, yeah. Very nice. Then uh, how, after you, left, you left Purdue then. Tell yes, us. I left in, in 1985 uh, after a sabbatical. Um, during these years that we had been talking about, because of my interest in curriculum students, I had become very much involved in national veterinary affairs. Uh, I served on the Council on Education for the American Veterinary Association uh, in accrediting colleges of veterinary medicine. Veterinary technology was developing, and I became a member of the accrediting team for veterinary technician programs. Um, I chaired both of those groups for several years and in the process was able to travel to every veterinary school and every veterinary technician school in the country, uh, really see their programs in some great depth and study them, uh, and also became involved in our efforts at the national level of continuing money for veterinary education, for veterinary research. and. Uh, in the process, the deans of the colleges through that 1970s and early 80 periods recognized the need for a greater interface with the federal government. They wanted somebody in Washington, D.C. who could interface with the National Institutes of Health, the Department of Agriculture, and the U.S. Congress. It was never intended to be a lobbying position in the sense that we think of full-time lobbyists, but it was certainly to have a component of that. So in 1985 then, uh, I'm sorry, 80, yes, 85, um, the, the deans uh, were pushing for something there, and I was talked into taking a sabbatical and going to Washington and working for six months uh, in the office of the American Veterinary Medical Association. And I had a fantastic mentor there uh, who was an AVMA employee. And I really fell in love with the Washington, D.C. and the political process. So I, after I came back then, uh, and because of some of the th things we had been able to achieve with the additional help in Washington, the deans of the veterinary colleges in North America decided that they would actually fund a full-time office uh, person and secretary uh, in Washington, D.C. And with my experience, I was offered that position. And with Dean Stockton's encouragement, even though he was leaving and we were seeking another dean here, uh, I took that position in Washington, D.C. So I moved in in the summer of 86 to Washington, D.C. and founded the office of the Association of American Veterinary Medical Colleges and for six years was the primary uh, uh, staff member, executive director uh, of that activity, uh, building it. And it's now an office of quite a number of people and continues to be very effective. Uh, so six, six years were, were great. And I, d w I went only with the 
provision that I would stay five years because I really wanted to end my home in academia. That I thought was my principal area. Not realizing at the time because Congress works on a two-year cycle and has to start over every two years. So had I left at the end of five years, most of our effort of the fifth year would have been lost because it needed to continue into the sixth. So I stayed six years and then uh, left Washington actually because I had a mother in Oklahoma who really needed uh, someone close by. Uh, and the dean at the College of Veterinary Medicine in Oklahoma uh, needed an associate dean very badly. And so I went to Oklahoma, was able to be there with my mother and Super. Now, then we brought you back to uh, Lafayette. And then came back because of children when I retired. Our children had been born here in Lafayette. They had stayed here, married here, had grandchildren. All right. We okay. came back. Uh, how about an outstanding event in your life? Got one of those? Anything comes to mind, an outstanding event? I'm also going to ask what about a fondest memory. You can take one or both. <laughs> oh. Well, outstanding events. Sometimes they're more. They're plural. Yes. You know, it's, it's simply, I think, the opportunity that my generation had to pursue uh, higher education. Without the uh, GI Bill of Rights, I would probably never be in higher education. Uh, without the motivation and stimulus of faculty members to do well and to select a career, I would never have followed that pathway. Um, without the constant stimulation from students to think young, be young, uh, be creative, I would never have been able to do so many of the things that I accomplished. So I think the outstanding event really is more of a 40, 50 year event than it is a single thing, and that is to go from a a poor boy on the farm uh, to a faculty member who's traveled the world and the United States and just had fantastic experiences all along I'm the gonna way. I'm going to ask you one other comment. You might, for the researchers, you might mention about the school coming up anniversary that you're working on. Yes. Right? Right. Uh, the uh, college took its first class in 1959. And uh, so in 1984, we had the 25th year celebration, and I was here at that time, uh, and we ended up, it was also the 100th year anniversary of the Indiana Veterinary Medical Association. So we ended up with a very nice publication, which uh, captured 100 years of veterinary medicine in Indiana, and 25 years of the College of Veterinary Medicine. Now we are approaching 2009, which will be the 50th anniversary of the College of Veterinary Medicine. And Dean Reed has convened a group of people who have an interest in that. And they have a number of subcommittees working on quite a variety of activities. Um, everything from a resolution from the legislature recognizing it to special programs with the fall conference, with the IVMA, special presentations, big focus on open house that students have each year. And in the process, one of those subcommittees is one that's uh, looking at the history of the of the school. Uh, there's a group of about eight people who are working on this, and they have uh, reached a point where they've made a decision on about three major products. One will be a traveling exhibit that can go to the state fair and to various programs that will try to capture a timeline in a single display of the 50 years of the College of Veterinary Medicine. A second one will be a publication. Uh, over 3,000 of our alumni have responded that they want to see at least a 50-page or larger uh, publication that can be either soft or hardbound. So we have, uh, each of us are researching and writing select parts for a history. And then we have a fantastic array of photographs, so we have decided that we will publish a DVD of photographs of the school rather than trying to put them into print form which is more expensive and takes more pages we'll try to have a DVD of photographs along with a written publication and we want to do that at a minimal cost if anything give it away for free sure. because of 3,000 alumni uh, and all of that should be done by next January at the start of that 50th year so the publication would be available for sale at a minimal price. Hopefully the DVD will be free. The traveling exhibit will be seen widely. 
and then it will be accompanied by a wide variety of events throughout the year 2009 uh, commemorating that 50th year anniversary. Sounds very good. Any closing comments that you'd like to make in summary? Uh, well, I would at least like to yeah. say something about the veterinary technology program. Yes. And again, the role of this veterinary school in that. Um, veterinary techn veterinarians have always hired someone to help them. But there is, uh, until the early 1970s, there had never been a training program for them. It was all on-the-job type training. Starting in the late 1960s, there was one program in New York that was started for training veterinary technicians. And it was enough to get the attention of Dean Stockton and a few faculty members here and the Indiana Veterinary Association. So in 68, 69, they actually conducted a study uh, of what would be the interest in a veterinary technology program in Indiana, and it came out to be very positive. Uh, not very many details. So in 71, 72, Dean Stockton picked that up, and there was another study conducted uh, which, in, which began to put some flesh on the bones of what could be a veterinary technician program. Uh, and then when I came in 1973, one charge in addition to the senior year and curriculum that Dean Stockton gave me was my job was to see if we could get a veterinary technology program started. Um, and I had done just enough at Missouri and a few other places to have some familiarity with it. Uh, I was on the AVMA Council on Education, knew what we were trying to do and thinking about accrediting such kind of programs if and when they developed. Um, and so we were very fortunate in a two-year period of time to get faculty committees to develop a curriculum, uh, to get the Indiana legislature to fund the program, and to recruit a very effective leader for it, Dr. Roger Lukens, who served uh, as the leader of that program until just a couple of years ago when he retired. It was the first and remains the only veterinary technician program fully incorporated and integrated into a College of Veterinary Medicine. We now have lots of them around the country, but they still remain pretty much isolated from the uh, veterinary not school. Integrated, was not not integrated well. Uh, Michigan is closer than any others uh, except for ourselves, but, uh, uh, and that has been a tremendous success. In addition then, and I had nothing to do with this, but Dr. Lukens and a faculty member who's now directing the program, Dr. Pete Bell, envisioned that becoming a four-year program so that students could either get an associate degree or a baccalaureate degree. And it is now either a two- or four-year program depending on their interest. And in the process, I would want to give university credit again, particularly the School of Technology, because we had fantastic cooperation with them. Most universities don't want technology programs. Uh, Purdue was fortunate to have a school of technology. Schools of technology generally wanted to have all the technology programs, but our leadership in this school of technology worked very closely with the veterinary school in developing that uh, for both curriculum structure, budgeting, funding. Uh, we could not have had better cooperation. So one of my f favorite memories of Purdue and I was a faculty member at uh, Purdue, Georgia, Missouri, Oklahoma State University, and for a while at the Western Universities of Health Sciences in Pomona. Purdue University, I think, has the best business management system of any university that I've been associated with, and they also have one of the most cooperative uh, faculties and administrations in terms of identifying ideas, working together, and achieving those ideas, and moving forward. So this is a fantastic place to live and work. It is, that's right. One final one note on the, is the placement for those people, as, as always, has grown for the vet tech program. All right, thank you. The, the placement for the graduates of the vet tech program? Has been excellent, they, and salaries have been increasing. So it, it's now, and it, it's, it's integrated with veterinary medicine almost as nursing is with human medicine. Do they have a separate uh, certification? Their yes, board? They have, each state has a separate certification. It's usually through the same board of examiners, but it is a totally separate certification process. Right, that's very good. I thank you very much, Billy. You're more than welcome. Thank you for the thank opportunity. Thank you very much. <laughs>